I would like to start with this image uh, taken at 1838 by uh, Daguerre. Daguerre. Uh, this is one of the first photographs ever taken. And actually, it's also the first photograph of humans. And now you are probably wondering, what is this guy talking about? Where are the humans? So, uh, in fact, in those days, it took around 10 minutes to take one photograph. So everything that moved, like carriages and maybe people, was blurred away. But if you look closely at the bottom right corner, or left corner for you, you can see this person standing there and shining his shoes. Well, it makes you wonder how long it took to shine shoes in those days, but there you have it. That's the first person ever photographed. If I jump forward a hundred years later, you can see you probably recognize the person in the middle around 1940. This is Stalin, and on the right of him, you can see this guy who's called Yezov. Well, um, sources were actually conflicting what exactly his role was. Some say he was the head of uh, secret police. Some say he was the commissioner of water transport. But actually, it doesn't really matter because after 1940, you see, uh, he had a quarrel with Stalin and, well, you can imagine what happened. Um, well, you know, image manipulation has been around ever since photography has been around. And maybe at the beginning it was very difficult to do. These days we have computers, right? So we have marvelous tools actually that help us manipulate and change images and create things maybe like this. Um, and maybe things that you're not so uh, fond about, which is something like this. Uh, but still, it takes time and a lot of effort, and usually it's in the realm of experts. So what I'm going to show you now is actually some of the manipulation tools that we've been working on. And the big question is, how do you do those manipulation? And we wanted to make it as simple as possible. Now, we'd like to see images everywhere, right? On our cell phones, for example, or on our TV screens or any computer screens that you have, and maybe also in this huge theater as well. The fact is that all those images or all those devices actually look different because they have different resolutions and they have different aspect ratios. So in fact, in order to find a way to show an image in all those devices, you need to change them a little bit. And in this case, what we did is we cropped the image. So cropping is a very simple operation where you change the size of the image or the aspect ratio. But cropping doesn't always work. So here's an image, and if I try to crop it, well, something has to give, right? So I can't insert all the content. Then you might be thinking, well, why not just scale the image? So if we use scaling, actually you can see that there are some artifacts created. What we wanted to do, what we wanted to find out is a way to change the size of the image while still preserving its content. And that's why we call this content-aware resizing. In order to change size, you don't change only uh, in one dimension, but you probably want to change it in a dynamic way. So here's an image, you can see the bicycle rider, and usually if you want to change the size of this image dynamically, what you do is you maybe squish it or maybe stretch it, and you can see that the artifacts are well shown. But uh, if I use our way of manipulation images, then you can see that the image actually changes the size while the rider actually is preserved. Uh, I'm going to move now actually to this nice device which is called the Microsoft Surface and I'm going to show you some more examples. So again, here is uh, if I want to do it dynamically. I can then change the size of the image as you can see here. And I, I remind you that this is scaling, right? This is what happens if you do scaling. Um, here's another example of two people. Right, so again, I change the size, I reduce the size, I can enlarge it. Um, here's my kid, actually, and uh, we were traveling and there was this nice uh, glacier that we visited, but he thought that it wasn't really, uh, you know, magnificent enough. So let's make it magnificent, right? So. Whoa. This slide is actually playing around with this. So, and the last one I'm going to show here, hopefully if it'll work with all the lights. Well, okay, we can again squeeze the images or extend them. 
All right, so what I'm going to do now is actually show you a little bit what's going on behind the scenes of all these applications, and it's actually quite simple. So, um, you know, images are created uh, based on pixels, so we have many pixels in the image. And what we define is we define what we call a seam path. And a seam path is just a set of pixels that go from the top of the image to the bottom and they contain one pixel in each row and they're connected. Now, the interesting thing is that if you take such a seam and you were to remove it from an image, what happens is that the image remains intact, but I removed one pixel for each row, so the width is one pixel smaller. Now, I can continue actually in doing it several times, and when you carve out many, many seams, the fact is that the image changes its aspect ratio, and you can do it both vertically or horizontally, as seen here. So the big question, of course, is which seams do we need to remove, right? So there are a lot of options, and actually there's a large amount, almost exponential, if you know what I mean. But anyway, what is finding the right seam? So the right seam to remove is actually the one that would be least noticeable, that you would be it would be able to trick your eyes. And least noticeable means that it contains the least amount of information or maybe, um, you know, at least uh, amount of content in the image. So what is important in an image? That's exactly what we want to say. So in fact, uh, looking at perception, what is important in an image is in fact the edges. So if you look at edges in images, in fact, you can almost recognize what this image is all about. And what we do is in fact, we look at, we find seams and we look for seams that contain the least amount of edges in them and we remove them. So that actually is how we remove seam and we reduce the size of images. But we, I've shown you that we can also extend images, not only shrink them. And how do we do that? Well, that's again a very simple trick. Instead of removing the seams, so here's a seam, for example, that we want to remove, what we do is we duplicate it. We just copy the pixels one by one and we have one uh, image with one picture larger. So here's an example. Uh, you can see an image, and here's the seam. Uh, maybe it's difficult to see here, but there's a seam there in somewhere. And in fact, when I duplicate it, you get a, an image which is one pixel wider. And well, if I continue doing it again and again, this is what I get. Hmm, not really what I wanted, right? Because if I continue removing the same seam again and again, what happens is that you get these smearing effects. So instead of doing this, what we do is, in fact, we take the order of the seams that we would have removed and we duplicate them one by one and you get this result. And now you can see that this is, in fact, the actual, this is, in fact, the actual result uh, of the pixels themselves. And again, you can see that the content is <laughs> preserved. So uh, now I have a question for you. Is this uh, reduced or enlarged? So you have, see, two pictures. It's a bit difficult to see, but you can see that actually it has a tail because Mount Fuji here has a steep slope and not a shallow slope. And therefore, it, this image was actually enlarged. It's not always a success, as you can see. Sometimes the seams need to move through some, uh, you know, places in the face, for example. But it's very easy to Correct, because what you do is you just put on some scribbles and say protect this region and don't let the seams pass through this specific region and what you get is of course better results. Now if you can detract seams from specific areas, maybe you can also attract seam to move through specific areas. And what you can see here, well, you're walking with your, you know, spouse or someone and you really didn't like that dog anyway and so maybe you're trying to do something like this so what we do is we remove seams and then we in insert some seams to enlarge the image back to its original size well you know something happened and maybe you're not really together so maybe you can also do this <laughs> but uh, anyway so here's another test for you one of those images are actually is the original image and the three others are, uh, well, we removed one shoe from them. So can you find the right image and what are the other images? I can give you a hint. This is the original image. 
So can you find which shoe was removed from each and every one? Yeah, okay, so I don't have a lot of time, so here's the solution, as you can see, <laughs> we removed some of those. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it's very hard to detect. So if we can uh, remove things from images, why not try to insert th things into images? And what you can see here is actually an interface that we've been working on, where people sketch you know, what they have in their mind, and they try to create new images based on this sketch. And what we do, well, this is, I think, not such a good drawing, but still, maybe some application can take this drawing and create real images out of it. Um, we also add some, you know, uh, names, and that would be important in a minute. So here's the image, and in fact, our application runs out and works a lot, and this is what you get. If you don't like it, actually, we have another option, so you can actually try this one. And just to show you that I'm not against, you know, coupling and so on, so here's a nice romantic image. If you don't like it, well, again, you can replace it again with something else. Well, not really, so here's another example. Uh, all in all, what, what's going on behind the scene here is really cut and paste. So we, not we, the application takes, you know, parts of images from different images and connects them together to create the final result. So there's a, some technology going on behind the scene there. But the interesting thing is, where, how does the application actually find the image components? What we do is, where do you find anything these days? Well, yeah, the web. So exactly that's what we're doing. We're using those keywords that people insert into the images, and we're looking for various images. But of course, when we have a lot of images, there's a lot of garbage also. So there's a lot of filtering going on and we remove complex images and we, remo we try to match the uh, specific uh, uh, things. So it doesn't really always work, right? So here's... Uh, <laughs> okay, and it takes time. It takes around two hours actually to create those images. So, uh, and of course you can personalize, next, that's the next step, so you can insert yourself into some comic books, or, for example, and create those types of things. So yeah, probably by now you understood that there's a lot of technology going on behind the scene, but one of the things that I want you to remember is that actually technology could be fun. And maybe if someone out there, you know, she's thinking whether she should take technology and math or not, well, go ahead and do it because it's fun. It could be a lot of fun. One of the fun things is also that you get to collaborate with many people because of computers. And in fact, all the works that I've shown you, I've been fortunate enough to work with students and colleagues all over the world to create those things. Um, so by now you're probably thinking, uh, should I believe my eyes or shouldn't I? You know, things are getting strange because as the tools get easier, it gets more complicated and more hard to see whether this is true or not. But one thing I want you to remember is that you know, have images conveyed reality ever? If you think at the first images that I've shown you. So apart from images, there were two other things that I've shown you, two key players in my story. These were people and computers. And in fact, in all the applications that I've shown you, there's an interaction between the people and the computer. Well, the computer, of course, does the tedious job, right? A lot of computation, a lot of work. And th that actually frees the humans to do the creative job. And that's one of the things that I'm strongly a believer, that you could, or you should create um, tools that will assist human creativity. And that's one of the things I want you to think about. Thank you very much.